as we grow in life and um, become involved in various things, there are certain things that we do that become almost like instinct. You don't have to think about, right? Like you just, when you go to, you couldn't explain to someone how to do the thing you do because you've done it so long that you just go through it. Um, I think for most of us, if you're driving age, that would be what we would think of, right? You ever drive with a, a brand new driver that like just read, <laughs> I got a dad over there shaking his head, um, that has just learned all the book stuff and they're in the car for the first time. It's like, all right, I got, you know, there's like the pattern of how you're supposed to look. You're supposed to check the road, check the mirror, check the road, check the other mirror. You know, and then now you drive and you don't even think about it. If you're a good driver, you do all that anyway, um, hopefully. Um, but you don't think about those things. And even to the point of if you travel the same route over and over again, it's like you show up where you're going, it's like, I don't even remember the trip. Uh, I went to school in Ankeny, Iowa, which is right off of I-35, which is just a little bit um, off of I-80. And if you look at a map, you can, it, from the map you can't really see that little jog of 35, but it looks like I-80 goes straight from Des Moines near Ankeny to Joliet where I grew up. If you drive on I-80 through Joliet, there's six exits for Joliet on I-80. My parents live real close to that. So four to five times a year, I would drive this trip back and forth. Um, you know, it probably should take about five hours. It didn't always take me five hours, but um, got very used to that trip. And there's only one time the entire strip that you have to be mindful of where you are because you have to follow 80 actually turns off and goes a little bit of a different way. And I got, I got to the point where eventually, you know, you show up pulling onto campus and it's like, I don't remember passing Iowa City. I don't remember crossing the border. I'm just here. Same thing on the way home. You just do it so many times that it becomes routine. You don't have to think about it. And sometimes that's a good thing in those trips. It wasn't that I was, you know, it's not that you're not paying attention. It's just that you've done it so many times that you just, you know what you're doing. You don't have to think through the steps. You don't have to think every single time. That time I drove a stick shift, so it was just, you know, like clockwork, going through the gears. I don't sit there and think, okay, at such and such RPM, I will go from this gear to that. You just do it. In the Christian life, there are certain things that should be like that. As we are disciplined, as we are diligent to do the things we are called to do, there are there, we should build up in such a way that it becomes instinct, almost a reflex, to obey God. Today, I think that is where, where Paul is driving Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 5. As you turn there, you'll see almost every Bible, I'm sure, in this room will have a heading that says something to the effect of preach the word. And that's what he that's what he's driving to here, that we should be involved in doing. So go ahead and turn with me to 2 Timothy. For this, we're going to look at verses, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. But for the sake of context, let's go back to chapter 3, verse 10, and, and get ourselves familiarized with where we are. So please stand with me as we read God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 10, and through 4, 5. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure all afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today that we can come together and look at your word. God, I just ask with so many things going on, the beginning of football season, 
still in the, the first few weeks of school starting. People that, that are dealing with different things in their jobs and in their homes, Lord God, that just at this time, Lord, that you would help us to clear our minds, that we would focus wholly on you. God, I pray that today you would challenge us through your word. God, I ask that as I preach this message, that, that just as we are looking at that I would preach the word, God, that you would cause us to remember the truths of your word and live upon them and everything else forget. God, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We start out in verse chapter 1. Paul has a big buildup. In the context of 2 Timothy, Paul is, is, is speaking to Timothy, his son in the faith, a young man that he had, had encouraged, had discipled, and he had put him in this church to be a pastor. And Paul is writing at the end of his life, looking ahead to say that persecution, sufferings are coming. And as a minister of the gospel, you need to be prepared. This is going to happen. It's not an if it happens, but a when it happens and how it progresses. And the entire book, it seems to build up to this point. This is, he, he's, he's brought up several things that are laying the foundation to make this statement here. And he continues to build in verse 1. He appeals to four things as he draws Timothy to this, this command he's going to give. He, he calls Timothy to, to think of the presence of God. He says, I charge you in the presence of God. In a way saying, as God is my witness, I, I challenge you, I urge you, I charge you to do this. Then he says, the presence of God and of Jesus Christ. Or even Jesus Christ. And he speaks of Jesus in three different ways. First is the judge. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead. And... I don't think there's a lot of difficulty in understanding that living in the dead, uh, but what, what that kind of there's two things: either you're living or you're dead. So this is all people that Jesus Christ is the judge and will judge all. He calls to his appearing that as Pastor Steve earlier in his prayer mentioned that he is coming again. I charge you therefore before God, the presence of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the judge, who is appearing, who will appear, and who is the King. Uh, could Paul make any stronger? of an appeal here. He puts all these things together to, to, to strongly urge Timothy to charge him in verse 2. And here it is. The, the, the climax of his argument, what he's getting to, to preach the word. Very simple. It's three words. Preach the word. This idea of preaching, it's the idea of proclaiming or heralding. When we hear the word preach, we almost, in our mind, just immediately slap a, a podium on there and put everybody sitting in the seats. But it's not exclusive to that. The word preach means to preach like a herald. In Paul days, rulers often had a special herald who would make announcements to the people. They were commissioned by the ruler to make those announcements in a loud, clear voice so that everyone could hear. Um, was not an ambassador that had the right of the privilege of negotiating, but he was a messenger with a proclamation that was to be heard and heeded. Not to heed the ruler's messenger was serious, and to abuse him was even worse. And Paul is saying he's calling him to be this herald to proclaim, knowing that there will be those that won't listen, and you will suffer for it. So sir, does this speak of, of the preaching that we're accustomed to right now, the preaching of the word? Absolutely. But does it go on farther than that to the one-on-one -on -one conversations we have? It certainly does, that we, are pro we proclaim his word. But then I wonder, does this go even farther than that? Would this even relate to as we use our social media? As we relate to people in that way? And as I've been studying this passage, that for some reason that has just been something that's been weighing on my heart. The way that we use, that we use the, the, the platform that we have. The different articles that we point to and share. It says to preach, but to preach the word. This is the content of our preaching. And the context to me drives that he's speaking of the written word of God. If we were to back up again into verses 15 and 16 and 17 of chapter 3, so that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, a reference to the Old Testament, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And here's the goal of that, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. So it seems that he's talking about proclaiming the written word of God. In verse 17, gave us our aim. If our aim in life and in our relationships with one another is just to give good ideas, life hacks, and tips and tricks to get through life, there's many ways we could do that. Um, it's the old thing, oh, your, your, your hand hurts, I'll kick you in the shin. And you're not thinking about your hand, you're thinking about your shin. 
But if it is our goal to encourage one another, to point each other to Christ, that, that as that verse said, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for good work, if godliness and serving God is our goal, then the context of our proclamation to one another must be his word. We point people to God as he has declared himself in his word. Think of the words of Jesus when he said in John 8, he said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Look at John chapter 17. John 17, starting in verse 9. This is Jesus' prayer. He says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given to me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these, I, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Jesus makes a direct correlation to our living in this world and the word which God has spoken, which we have recorded in the scriptures. <clears throat> but oftentimes when we, when we think of the situations that come in life, how many times, how often do we say things or hear things like, well, that person, they're not ready for the word of God. They're, they're just not ready to hear it. I think there's a, a big misunderstanding that's foundational to that. I know I'm making you turn a lot, but turn to Psalm chapter 19. Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law of the Lord, which was contained in the written word of God, is able to convert the soul, it says. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. We don't have to clean people up so that God can work. God alone is the one that changes hearts, and he, he uses his word to do that. As, as we, when we went through Hebrews, Hebrews 4, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow. It is a marrow, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word, when God speaks, he's able to divide that which is indivisible. Today, I think that we as Christians in our day and age, in our society, we need a recommitment to the old doctrine, sola scriptura. That the Bible is the supreme authority in all matters of doctrine and practice. That doesn't deny that there's other authorities that govern Christian life and devotion. But everything else is subordinate to what God has said. It's subordinate and corrected by the written word of God. We live in a world where information comes at us like crazy. We are bombarded with so many different ways to do different things. And unfortunately, I think or we seem far less willing to cling to the truth of God's word and to stand on it than the latest study making the rounds on Facebook. That there's these things, and we see truth from God's word, and, and we say, well, this is what I believe, but it's not until it's confirmed in other ways that we're willing to stand on it. Take, for example, um, something that I think I can say without offending anybody, hopefully. Um, think of the cre just creation. That's pretty simple, right? Genesis 1. It's right there. But how many of us were like, 
Yeah, I believe that creation thing. But then when Ken Ham has an awesome argument, now it's like I stand on that. See, now I have a scientific reason to prove what I believe in the scriptures, and I stand on it. I'm all for studying, listening to Ken Ham and having those reasons, but we don't stand on doctrine because it's proven. The just shall walk by faith. We stand on what God's word has said. And then it's so encouraging when we see the other things. I think that probably our reason for that is it's sometimes based on our own doubt that we doubt things, and then when we see the other evidence of, of, of what we think is true, then it, it encourages us. And I think sometimes we just think that when it comes to other people, if they could just see these facts, they would be persuaded the way I am. But again, God works. God speaks through His Word. And there's also a theological shift that goes on. Um, the theologians have historically talked about how God reveals Himself in two different ways, through special revelation and general revelation. Um, revelation is the teaching of Scripture regarding God's communication of truth. We call that revelation. That teaching has been acknowledged and cherished by evil, evangelical theologians in, in different ways. But very, there's a really similar thought that goes with it. One says that revelation by nature transcends the human capacity to discover it as a direct communication from God commun concerning truths which no person could discover by himself. That, that we are, by nature, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We cannot discover God. We cannot study enough to show who God is. But God must reveal himself. Another um, theologian said, it's the making known that which is unknown, the unveiling of truth which is veiled. Another says, it's the act of God where he communicates to the mind of man truth, not known before and incapable of being discovered by the mind of man, un man, mind of man unaided. Another says, revelation is the act of God where he discloses himself or communicates truth to the mind where he makes manifest to us as creatures that which could not be known in any other way. Again, uh, uh, just the overwhelming co consistency, the expressive, the expressive of the fact that God has made known to men truths and realities which men could not discover for themselves. It's the, necessary, it's the necessity of an act of God. But I think there's a shift where rather than seeing that revelation is something that comes from God, we, we blur into anything that we consider truth because there is a logical thought that if God is the creator, everything that's true must fit into his created order. Right? That there can be nothing that is true apart from fitting into the way God has created things. So there's a, bit, there's a truth there. But there's a, we have this desire for some reason to say, I observe this and I have come to believe this is true, so it must be equal to what God has said in his word. Because if truth is truth, then it's truth. The problem of that is that on the historical side of things is that when we talk of general revelation, specific re special revelation, and we say general revelation, it's not that there's truth out there that we have to somehow find, but that God has made access of it to all people. It, it speaks to who receives that. It's general in its scope. It reaches to all people. The, the problem, why, you know, why I, I think about this and I'm going to that is I think there's two dangers in the way that we handle the things that become important to us as we study them out. And especially, you know, and I'm not thinking of anything specific that someone has put up on their Facebook or whatever, but, you know, it's like, I, it, when people, when I see stuff about parenting, I've got a five-year-old, a four-year-old, a three-year-old, almost three-year-old, and a newborn, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Any help is, is great. So I click on these things, and you've got all these long lists of, like, things behind people's names that mean important things, and it's like, therefore, we've studied this out, and this is what you have to do. And then a Christian comes along and takes it, makes it a step further. If you love your children in Jesus, this is what you do. And it's like, oh, i got to do all these things. And then the very next day, someone else posts something, and they have people with equal credentials. And they've done a very similar study, and now they think, this over here is what you have to do. And then I'm sitting there like, I don't have the words behind my name. How am I going to figure out which one's right? But if, our, if that's where we find our confidence in life, if that's where we're going to decide what we're going to do, and, and I'm not trying to minimize the using our brains in any way, but we get tossed about to and fro with those things. If we start first with what God has said, and I will stand on His authority in Scripture, then that's how I will navigate through all these other things. That, that's where we should be. That, there's two problems with not doing it that way. 
The first thing is falsely perceived truth. These two, two opposing ideas cannot both be true. They could exist in different contexts, but they can't both be true. Um, I, like earlier, you can't be alive and dead at the same time. So sometimes we assign these human discoveries in this category of this equal revelation of God. We give them this aura of validity and, and authority that they do not and indeed cannot merit. So we assign them this category, and when in fact that concept is a theory con concocted by a person, then we lend God's name to a person's ideas. It's fallacious. It's no matter what the intrinsic truth of that, it's not the same exact thing as God's revealed word. The second thing is then we to build these trump card arguments. And we say, because I know that this is truth, this is revelation from God, now you can't argue it. I know that this is the truth. And the only time that we can do that is when it comes explicitly from God's word. Because in any other way, and even some of the things we take out of God's word, I have inserted myself or another human being who is open to error. Very simply, if, if something is revelation, if God said it, then God said it and it's true. It's not up to us to figure out whether or not it's true. I'm not saying that, again, that these things are useless. What I'm saying is be careful. Where do we find authority? Where do we find authority for life and doctrine? It's God as he has revealed himself in Scripture. Where do we have unshakable confidence as a source of truth? Again, God as he has revealed himself to us in his word. At the core of our faith is our confidence in the inspiration and inerrancy and authority of scriptures. I can't say that about anything else. I can't even say that about all the arguments I can make about why I am a Chicago Bears fan. There's nothing else that can hold that type of weight. Wherever fallible humanity is involved, there is opportunity for error. I know that's true for me. I, I, that's something I have to constantly remind myself that any time I, I can say black and white God's word says this, I know it's truth and I'll proclaim it but any time I have to start putting my own reason in, I know it is open for error and that doesn't mean it is wrong it means it's open to error and we have to be humble that's when we start using words like I think, this might be I think this is wise if we want to help other people, we know the word of God we want stability in this life. And that doesn't mean that everything goes our way, but we stand on the authority of God's word. We conform our lives to what he has told us in his word. He says, Timothy, in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who is the judge, the king, who's coming again, preach the word. In the context of there's all these other teachers teaching these other things, you teach the word. And then he develops that even farther. He says in verse 3, or I'm sorry, Right after that in verse 2, he says, Be ready in season and out of season. Preach the word. Be ready. I was discussing this with someone else a couple of weeks ago, and they were, um, they were very um, knowledgeable about the Navy SEALs. And I'm not, I'll, I'll be honest. So I had to research some of these things, but they said, they were telling me that in the Navy SEALs, that the goal is that there, there will never be a poor marksman at the Navy SEAL. They shoot so much that the goal is to get to the point from the time they, they draw their weapon to shoot, it's all reflex. They're, they're just so driven with that um, that it, they don't even think about it. They just have to do it. There was One of the guys that was a leader and a, and a trainer um, was writing and wrote an article and he said that he had listened to that, you know, some of you I know do that CrossFit, that the CrossFit coach is Greg Glassman had introduced him to this term virtuosity. I've never used that term in my life. Um, back in 2005 in an article where he talked about the importance of virtuosity as a CrossFit trainer and the gymnastics definition of performing the uncommon uncommonly well. They, they would perform the uncommon, or perform the common uncommonly well. He said as a Navy SEAL sniper instructor, he understood the style of training and had been practicing it for years, but he wasn't able to put it into words until he read that to perform the common uncommonly well. He said that in his realm, being a virtuoso requires hours upon hours of dedication and perseverance. There's no shortcuts to becoming a master, but there is a tendency, he said, especially among his younger shooters that come in, especially to ignore fundamentals and to quick, quickly move to wanting to learn advanced and cool-looking techniques. Get all this fundamental stuff that builds so we can do things, we're going to get rid of that because I want to look cool. I want to look like... I don't know, Mark Wahlberg or Sylvester Stallone or whatever it is, I want to you know, I gotta go for the kill shot, do the cool thing. 
She says, this pattern of novice training is apparent in all kinds of skills, such as playing a musical instrument. I know I'm guilty of that one, as I learned how to do everything wrong because it looked cool. Mm -hmm. Learning a new sport or any other type of skill. The immature yearning is an obstacle to those aiming for perfection and should be avoided at all costs. And then this idea, the, another Navy SEAL said that when they were trained, and, and this is uh, Team 6, they said that there was more, there's more than learning how to pick a lock open. Uh, they learned how to blow doors off their hinges. They, they shot thousands of rounds every day. That they said that in one year, this team spent more money on 9mm ammunition than the entire Marine Corps on all of their ammunition for the year. Because they were dedicated to what they were to do. That when the time came, they would be ready. That's how we, we should be so familiar with God's word that we are at any point in time ready. We don't think, we don't think, through. I'm not saying we turn our brains off. But it's not that panic that how many people that, that, that come and say, so-and-so was talking about this is going on in their life, and I was just like, uh... And then we have like those three, four verses that we just run to for everything and skip the context and say, this is what it is. We need, to, to, we need that dedication and perseverance to studying God's Word, to seeing Him, him through it, that we are able, when, when the rubber hits the road, when life comes up, that we are able to say, God has spoken of that. This is what he has said. This is who he is. That it's just a reflex. It's not an odd thing for us to do. That we don't just jump to the coffee cup verses because they sound nice. But that we can proclaim God's word. We are always ready. It says, be ready in season and out of season. On the one hand, it's pretty easy to understand that, again, it's either in season or out of season. There's no third option. So it means always. Always be ready. But it is good to, under, to, to think about that for a moment. It's easy today to think of that today is football season. Starts today. Last Sunday, I could not turn on my TV and watch a professional football game. Unless it was a rerun. But today, I can and I will. If the, God, if the Lord does not return, I will be sitting on my couch watching a football game today. Probably even a clear understanding if you understand fishing and hunting. That there is a time that you are allowed to go walleye fishing and a time that there's not. And if you go out and shoot a deer when it's not deer season, you're in big trouble. There's a time to do it and a time to not do it. It says to be ready. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. There is, there is a time when it is welcomed. There are, praise the Lord, times when people come and say, I, I don't know what's going on. Well, what does God have to say about this? And it's wonderful. There's a time when we want to do that. There's times when people come and they're ready and we don't want to do that. But there are times when it's in season. There's also times when it's out of season. Uh, this, this word construct doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament. Uh, but it's the exact opposite of being in season. But what this comes together to mean is that a minister of the gospel is to seek opportunities to preach the gospel. Even at such periods when it might be inconvenient to himself or where there might be hindrances and embarrassments, or where there is no stated appointment for preaching. He is not to confine himself to the appointed times of worship, or to preach only when it will be perfectly convenient for himself, but is to have such an interest and, per, an interest and earnestness in the work that will lead him to do it in the face of embarrassments and discouragement. When no one else agrees, when no one else thinks that it's popular to stand on God's word, we will. And will proclaim it. Whenever we find the opportunity, a man who is greatly intent on an object will seek every opportunity to promote it, hence the bear's tie. He will not confine himself to stated times and places, but will present it everywhere, at all times. Therefore, a man who merely confines himself to the stated seasons of preaching the gospel, or only preaches it when it's convenient to himself, should not consider that he has come up to the requirement that's stated here. He should preach in his private conversations, in the intervals of public labors, at the side of the sickbed, and wherever there is a prospect of it doing good to anyone. If our hearts are full of love for the Savior and souls, we cannot help but do this. And I, I, I have to think, as I, as I read this passage and look around, it's out of season, by and large. The proclamation of God's Word is not in season right now. Certain verses, yeah, Certain concepts, maybe, but the entirety of God's Word, we are entering a time where it is out of season to stand on the truth of God's Word. And we have to ask ourselves, what will we do it? 
It says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. This idea of convincing, it, it, when we're speaking of God's Word and we're reasoning with people, we're convincing them based on the arguments of God's Word as well, of what is right and what is wrong. So when people don't, they need to know what's right or wrong. Rebuke, that's based on authority that we're saying, what you're doing is wrong and it needs to stop. Mostly we know what is right and wrong. Our, our problem is not usually that we need to be convinced, but that we need to be rebuked. And he says, convince, rebuke, exhort. This can also carry with the idea of encouraging. We don't just beat people over the head with Bibles. And just walk around, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. But there is encouraging truth in God's Word. If we just sit back and think of who we are in Christ, the blessings that He's given to us, that should propel us in life. This is more on a positive side, but in almost every passage where there's a statement like this, earlier in chapter 3, right here, it's almost 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 that it's on the side of, Rebuking and reproving to that of encouraging. We like to make ourselves out to be victims, but, but sometimes even when we are victims, which isn't always the case, even in those situations, often we, don't, we respond wrong, and we put ourselves in a place that we need to be corrected. It says to teach with long-suffering. If you're going to teach people, whether it's a parent in the home, a pastor behind a pulpit, a small group leader, a friend, you have to recognize that change is a process, not an event. It never happens, it almost never happens overnight. By, by the grace of God, sometimes it God does. God just does a, a work in an instant, but often he is teaching us through that process, and we need to be patient. For me, I have to remind myself, when, you know, you, so there's some people, and you just tell them things over and over, you point them the same thing over and over, and they're like, oh yeah, that's great, I, I should do that, or I should stop doing that, and they go right back in. And it's discouraging, and I have to remember myself. That's the pattern of life for me, too. I'm typically, it's the same thing, gradually getting better, not in a straight line, but up and down. We have to teach with long-suffering, and in all honesty, we need others to be patient with us. It says, preach the word, but then he gives the reason for why he's so strong on this right now. Verses 3 and 4. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from truth and aside to fables. Because the time is coming, they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to listen to what you say and say, we're out of here. And not just in the sense that we're just gone from this church and we're finding another one two miles down the road. <coughs> but they will not endure that sound teaching. And they talk strongly of their desires. But this is based on their own desires. Because they have itching ears. And that, isn't that a vivid picture? You ever have an ear itch? It's like there is nothing in the world as important as stopping that in that moment. With, you know, you're, you've got to get the car key, the Q-tip, what? You're not supposed to stick anything in your ears. Uh, but that's what we do in that moment. It's like I got to stop the itching. And think of that vivid picture then with seeking false teaching. I will not stop until I hear what I want to hear. And we're really quick to throw that on what other people teach, aren't we? And to say that this is the prosperity gospel. This is, you know, Jesus' is love and that's all you need to know. But in the context of church history and what's here, it probably is more likely in this time, the itching, people itching ears think, give me more things I can do to be acceptable to God. Give me the list. Let me sit on a pole for three years. Let me do something to prove my worth. We all have things that our ears itch for that are not always correct. But he says the, the time is coming when they will heap up. It's not just they'll find the person to teach them. They will heap up teachers. This is going to be a big thing. It's not going to be the, the, the abnormal. It's going to be the norm. Now, as we think of this, this context here, we can see and make examples of that all around us. And if this is the case, it shouldn't discourage us, but it should rather animate us in the proclamation of God's truth. We should never be surprised. The truth is opposed. God said it. We don't have to look through scriptures and say, why is the truth being opposed? It's done. We can move on. God has said this is what will happen. This should encourage us. As Paul is trying to encourage Timothy to proclaim the word, when we see the truth being opposed, we shouldn't be discouraged and say, what can we do? We know what we can do. We proclaim the word of God. And then Timothy, or Paul says to Timothy, here's the conduct to do it in verse 5. It says, you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. 
So always be watched, be vigilant, vigilant against error and against sin, and faithful in the performance of duty for yourself and for those around you. So as to endure afflictions, they're going to come. And just as Paul had said earlier, it should be our, our, our prayer, our hope, that, that we will endure the afflictions and see that it is God who has brought us through. He says to do the work of an evangelist. That almost seems out of place, doesn't it? But, but a reminder again that people around us are dying and going to hell. They're not trusting in Christ for salvation. He doesn't say be an evangelist. He says do the work of an evangelist, which kind of clues us in that we sometimes we want to make an argument like, well, that person is an evangelist. That's their job to do that. But if we look at what Ephesians 4 said and what Paul says here, he says that you're not an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. And he says to fulfill your ministry. See through it to the end. In a few verses, Paul's going to say that's where he is in life. I'm at the end of my life. I'm being poured out as a drink offering, but I have fought the good to fight. He wants Timothy to be able to come to the end without regrets, fulfilling the ministry that was given to him. I told you earlier of my um, driving to and from Iowa for school. That eventually that just became like a routine thing, unless there was something going on. Even when the rains were pouring down, it was just all the way through it, almost as a reflex. There was a time when I drove somewhere that that wasn't the case. It was to my wedding. Thankfully, I had planned like two days ahead of time to come down and get some stuff done. But my best friend and I loaded up in Joliet, uh, got in my car, packed this little Mustang out full of stuff. And we drove down. Now, when I went to Iowa, I didn't tell you this before, the first time we ever drove out there, my dad sat me down at the kitchen table and, and pulled out this old thing people used to use called a map. And he looked, and he was a straight shot, but we still, we sat down and looked through, noted the major cities we would go through, where we crossed the border, and all that kind of stuff. So by the time I drove for the first time, I was ready. I didn't do that to drive down to my wedding. Someone said it's a straight shot on 55, and I believed them. <laughs> and for the most part, they were correct. But we hit some construction part of the way down, and I pulled over, you know, we had to get Mountain Dew and Nerds Rope or whatever it was at that time that would keep us away. So we stopped at a gas station in the middle of the construction and somehow must not have gotten back on where we were supposed to. About an hour and a half later, I started thinking, I don't, I've never driven this before, but I don't think I'm seeing the types of cities that I'm supposed to. And I said to some of my friends, oh, you're fine, and I went back to sleep. I really knew there was a problem when I noticed that I was entering Indiana. <laughs> so I said we gotta stop I pulled over to a gas station I bought one of those archaic things the map I folded it out and now here in the middle of trying to get where I'm supposed to be by a certain time I'm in Indiana fumbling through trying to find where I and to this day I don't know what happened I've looked at the map several times trying to retrace my steps and I don't know what happened how we got where we were <coughs> which way are we going to, to proceed in life are we going to be prepared so that as life comes up, whether it's the issues in our life or as God gives us opportunities to proclaim to one another that we're ready, whether it's in season or out season, and we can proclaim God's word because we've been diligent students of it and God has, has taught us through his word? Or are we going to find ourselves in Indiana? No offense to Indiana. <laughs> Trying to figure out how to use the map, figuring out where we're going. And you guys know what I mean by that, that, that when we're in the midst of the storm, it's so much harder. There's so much other things we have to figure out that if we were ready, if we were standing on God's word, it'd be a different case. Or aren't you thankful that in either of those situations, God is at work? Amen. That he is always at work, uh, accomplishing his plan, conforming us to the image of Christ. So it's not a matter of, of if God is involved, but what is he doing? And do I want to learn things the easy way or the hard way? To be realistic, what does your life look like right now? Are you a person that, that proclaims the word? Or do you find your confidence for life in something else? Are you ready? Or are you heading somewhere you don't even know and hoping it's going to work out fine? In your notes, uh, I didn't put the typical thing where we follow through with the message, but just I asked a couple questions for you to think about. To take time this week to sit down and think through. And things like, is there a time in your life that you study God's Word, or is it just when it happens, it happens? 
If there's not a time, well, when can you do that? And you say, I don't have any time. What do you need to get rid of in your life so that you do have time? And I just put several things in there that we probably ought to be able to have an answer with, especially in our culture today. I mean, simply we should be able to say, who is God? And give a biblical understanding, a biblical defense of that. What is salvation? Surely we should know. Be able to proclaim us when the salvation is in God alone, that he saves that salvation alone comes through a son, Jesus Christ. And to think through it. And maybe you're answering those questions and you're saying, well, no, I'm not ready. <clears throat> Repent. Confess that. And start today. Become a student in God's word. Maybe you're saying, you're saying, I'm doing pretty good. I know for me, whenever I find myself saying I'm doing pretty good, i got to watch out because pride comes before a great fall. Um, but we can never be good enough students in God's word. We will never know it all completely. And we need to, to, to persevere in it so that we can do a common thing like studying God's word. I don't say that to bring it down, but it's, it's a, a thing of just daily life. But we can proclaim God's word in an uncommon way. And that he will use that for his glory. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, today I thank you for your word. And God, I just think how blessed we are that we have your word, Lord, that you have declared yourself to us, and, and Lord, we'll never fully comprehend you. That's just the nature of the fact that you're God and we're mere, mere humans. But Lord, we can know you how you said we need to through your word. God, I pray that you would just cause us to have a, a, a recommitment to your word. God, that we would proclaim it, that we would stand on it, and Lord, that you would bless us through that. And we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.